Okay, we are now going, we're about to go live. Any, there we are, we are live. We've got eight minutes to go. So now, once again, I got to start the countdown clock. And there we go. And I should set it to seven minutes there. Okay. Everything is um, almost good. I just realized I lost the other Google Doc that I need. Oh, here it is. Good. I haven't lost anything. Everything is, everything is as it should be. Thank you. I was starting to get a little panicky there. Good. Okay. And you can see the countdown clock. Um, mm -hmm. all right. And you can see my picture. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting. I don't see me. I see the countdown clock, the yin yang, and you. Good enough. And if I go here. No. Or here. Okay. Yeah, because I do the live streams, even though I've done a, a well over a dozen, probably 20 of them so far, at the last minute I forgot which buttons to push. I understand. And, took me a few minutes to get it straightened out, but that's, so it's nice to have that 10 minute cushion. Yeah. And, well, so we were starting to talk about uh, doing something more on um, featuring the Schwartz report. Sure. I guess we should have a private discussion. We don't yeah. need to talk Yeah, we'll set up that. a Zoom sometime this week or, you know, whatever it's, whenever it's convenient. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've got five minutes to go. We're definitely going to get a lot of questions on 2060. Um, Have you got that thing up where people can uh, want to be notified of the book? Oh, you know what? I put it on the other video. Let me put it on to the live stream right now. Hold on. I think I can. Good, because otherwise I get inundated with oh, no, emails. And... Customer story. Okay, we can go. Okay, let, I'm pretty sure I can do that. Um, let's see. <coughs> uh, let's see. Oh. All right. I thought I had it up on here, but I don't see it here. I'll have to go. Um, Hold oh, on. Uh -huh. huh, where did I put it? Oh, it may already be in the live stream window. Just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check for that. So we still have three minutes here. Yeah, it's already there. Good, thank you. Uh huh. That saves me from having to answer countless emails. Yeah, just if yeah, right, it's it's in the description of this uh, live stream. Good. Okay. 
And we've got about two minutes to go. I still hear that hissing sound. Oh, in the chat. Good. I, <laughs> the volunteers overheard our conversation and I should, I'll, I'm gonna let them know in particular what they should put in the chat here. Uh, There. So now the volunteers will also be able to uh, let people know about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we've got just about a minute to go, 30 seconds. So we'll be starting momentarily. Fact, I'm gonna. There we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. I'm here today with Stefan Schwartz. We're very happy to be with you, uh, Stefan. Recent Stefan's recent interview with me on uh, remote viewing the year 2060 has, by our standards, gone viral. I was going to tell you it's had now 177,000 views in about three weeks. So I know we're going to get a lot of questions uh, about that particular project, but I thought it would be very useful to begin our program today to talk about remote viewing in general and why you think uh, in spite of the various difficulties that uh, remote viewers experience, why you think it's a useful tool, Stefan? Well, let's start with what remote viewing is because there's all kinds of misinformation about this. First of all, remote viewing, the term is terrible because it has nothing to do with remote and has nothing to do with viewing. What it is about is opening to non-local consciousness, that aspect of consciousness which is not physiologically based. When you get into this research and you really get into it deeply, what you confront is the reality that consciousness exists before incarnation and continues after corporeal death. So what you're doing with remote viewing is you are training yourself to quiet the sense impressions that your neuroanatomy is con con constantly bombarding you with. That is, it's hot, it's cold, it's dark, it's light, it's noisy, it's quiet. All that stuff that we are constantly processing, all of that retreats into the background and you open to this other part of your consciousness, what religion calls the still small voice. People have been doing this for thousands of years. The oldest remote viewing that we have on record is the 46th chapter of Herodotus, History of the World, uh, which dates to the 5th century BCE. So, um, People have been doing this for a very long time. This is not new. And I say that as one of the people that created remote viewing. It's, 
Remote viewing is a technique and there is not a single technique. There are lots of different ways to do it. People have been doing it different ways for thousands of years. They didn't call it remote viewing. They talked about talking with the gods or contacting the eternal or, you know, all sorts of other things. But basically, the key to the whole business is the ability to attain and sustain intention focused awareness. How do we know this? We know this for two reasons. One is because in the empirical science, observational sciences that make up things like shamanism or uh, various kinds of metaphysical traditions, they all teach the same thing and that is how to attain and sustain intention focused awareness. That's why they teach meditation in martial art dojos and Tibetan lamasaries and Buddhist temples and Catholic uh, uh, seminaries. You have to develop some technique and there are many ways to do it in which you can quiet the, the physiological sensations that make up so much of our thinking and you can hear this as I say, what religion calls the still small voice. And you can get anything. In fact, that's, I think, one of the reasons that the government stopped funding this program, at least openly, I think they may still do it, was because it freaked Congress people out to know that there were no secrets. And therefore, their affairs or their uh, corruption could be turned up by remote viewers and it made them crazy. In any case, so first of all, remote viewing, we're dealing with some kind of technique which allows you to attain and sustain intention focused awareness. Second, you get all kinds of information and the key problem with it is that we get from almost from birth training in how to do analysis. And there are all kinds of research studies that show that, for instance, if I showed you the corner, the corners of a square, but not the lines that connect the, the lines, just the corners, you would still most of the time see it as a square or a rectangle. Because we are trained to analyze and part of the key to remote viewing successfully is to stop analyzing and simply report the sense impressions that come into you. And we know that all the senses report, taste, touch, smell, sound. People can accurately report that. The thing that they don't do very well on, most people, is things which are analytical, like trying to get a specific number or trying to get a specific name. I created associated remote viewing precisely to deal with that problem. I might not be able to get the word Jeffrey but if Jeffrey was an apple and Sam was a pair of scissors and people described an apple, I would know that it was Jeffrey. Now, how accurate can it get? Both my own research over the last 60 years and uh, the research of other of the pair lab and the SRI lab, SAIC, all arrived at pretty much the same conclusion. And that is, uh, particularly in the work that I do, which was not oriented toward proving if it existed, but trying to do something of practical utility with it, the archaeological work. Um, we know, for instance, in the archaeology projects or the criminology projects, that about 35 to 40 percent of the information cannot be evaluated. That is, if the remote viewer said, as Jeffrey was doing the interview, he was thinking about his wife who was traveling somewhere. Unless you wrote that down someplace, there's no way to evaluate that. So if the captain was thinking of his children as his ship went down, no way to know that unless he left some record. So about 35 to 40 percent of information that you get, not just in describing targets like a picture, but in doing something of practical utility, you're just not going to be able to evaluate. It could be right, but there's just no way to know. Of the remaining percentage, 
60 to 55 to 65 percent that we get, we expect to see between 75 and 80 percent of it be correct or partially correct. And what do I mean by partially correct? Well, if I said uh, the man doing the interview who was wearing a red shirt, I would be correct. There was a man, he was doing the interview, but your shirt is not just red, it has multiple colors. So that would be considered partially correct in the protocols that I use to analyze the data, which is literally concept by concept. So when you do concept by concept analysis, we expect to see between 75 and 85 percent be evaluated as either correct or partially correct, but still operational. And that's pretty much true. Uh, Russ Targ wrote about this and gave the same kind of information. Uh, the pair group at Princeton published pretty much the same stuff. So we know looking across all of the labs and literally tens of thousands of remote viewings. I mean, I personally have interviewed 23,000 people uh, to do remote viewing that those are pretty consistent. Now, the other interesting thing uh, that turned out of the archaeological work was that in all of my archaeology projects, I ran a parallel uh, uh, search uh, it was conducted not by me, but by other experts who were specialists in the field using electronic remote sensing. That would be side scan sonar, proton precession magnetometer, ground penetrating radar, all those sort of things. In every instance, in every one of the archaeological projects, the electronic remote sensing search did not produce the location, but the remote viewing did. And so that tells us that with remote viewing, you can reliably get things and you can get them. We also know from the, again, the archaeological work, you can get information about objects down to s fractions of an inch. I mean, people describing little glass tubes that were five sixteenths of an inch or little tiles uh, that made up a, a, a floor that were five or six to sixteenths of an inch. So we know that you can get very detailed descriptions and you can get descriptions that electronic remote sensing cannot find. That's what makes remote viewing particularly useful because you can do things that you just can't do any other way. The other thing I, I think it's important to clarify is that remote viewing is not a search technique in the sense of an electronic searching. You don't do surveys. You just go to the place that they said it was would be located and it's either there or it is not there. Uh, so you're not searching. You're searching at the before you do the field work. But once you get to the field work, it's not searching. It's either find or not find. And that was a, a that was a very nice description, and we have lots and lots of questions coming in from from the viewers. I think we're definitely getting above average size viewing audience. The first question comes from our mutual friend, John Alexander, who has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud in the past. He says he has a question that he's already discussed with you. Are the changes currently taking place in this country the ones that will drive our geopolitical realignment in the future? Uh, well, as usual with John, that's a very excellent question. Okay, let's let's focus on that for a minute. As you know, I do the Schwartz Report, SchwartzReport.net, uh, every day, seven days a week, give it away. Um, and I'm looking at trends which are shaping the future. So if I look at my 2050 or the 2060 data, what I see, for instance, just as an example that stands out as I was doing research this morning, the 2050-2060 viewers uh, either they describe the United States as still existing 
but being very different in substance because power has devolved down to states or groups of states. Now, how, how do we evaluate that? Well, of course, until we get to 2050 or 2060, we can't know for sure. But what we can see, and this is what I look at, I look at these trends because I, I get this kind of remote viewing data, so I think, well, how do you evaluate something like that? And in this case, if you look at the growing secession movement that you see in red states, and I see article after article now of uh, both just general commentary from media and also descriptions. And the other day in, in Schwartz Report, I put up a paper from the MISE, M-I-S-E-S, MISE, -E whatever it's pronounced, uh, a think tank in Alabama, putting forward a a, an approach to how you might break the United States down into regions. If you look at the research you see that the red state, blue state uh, schism is become, becoming more and more pronounced. The red states are passing a whole raft of laws of Roe, the overturn of Roe, and these rigid uh, uh, anti-abortion laws that are being passed in red states, which are causing uh, massive changes in health care in those states and the red states already have the worst health care. In fact, one of the things that stands out that the remote viewers talk about that I'm seeing happen is that red states almost uniformly produce inferior social conditions to blue states. Uh, maternal mortality, infant mortality, obesity, life expectancy, incarceration, uh, literacy, so we can already see these trends starting that the 2050-2060 remote viewers are describing. And so I think this idea that the United States is going to still exist uh, at a certain level, but that real power is going to devolve down to the states, I think you see that already happening in the red states. And you see it in the blue states because one of the things that very few people seem to realize is that the red states put a dollar in to the treasury, federal treasury, but they take more than a dollar out, whereas the blue states put a dollar into the federal treasury and they take less than a dollar out. And thus, the blue states are underwriting the failed or the inferior governance of the red states. And they also are becoming interested in seeing that the country breaks up differently. I mean, I had a conversation the other day with a physician in Washington State, where I live, who uh, said, you know, I'd be perfectly happy uh, if the red states don't want to give women e equal equality and don't want to let them control their own bodies. Well, then so be it. We blue state people um, we're going to see that it's available and possible. And as a result of that, and you can already see this happening, I've begun to see in the academic literature discussions of the effects that the, uh, the Roe overturn are going to have on uh, colleges and universities in the red states because young fertile women uh, who are sexually active are choosing not to go to red state colleges and universities. And similarly, young doctors who are graduating from medical school or from their residencies are choosing not to uh, set up their practices in, in red states because it's too dangerous. I mean, if you treat a woman who has a miscarriage and some politician decides that that was really an abortion, you as a doctor could go to prison. So if you're a young doctor, that's not where you want to go to set up your practice. So I think we're seeing the beginning, the, the sort of the first robins of, of, of these trends which are going to significantly change and shape the United States. And, and so the answer to John's question is yes, the remote viewing gives us things 
or for instance in my case, gives me things to pay attention to and I then begin looking around to see if I can find the first expressions, the first manifestations of, of uh, uh, something happening which builds that trend that the 2050 or 2060 people were talking about. And I can see many of these. Okay, a wonderful answer to a wonderful question. Here's a question from Elizabeth Lord, who is one of our volunteers. She says, based on what you've learned about remote viewing, do you think that we have free will or that the future is unchangeable or that it already happened? That is also a very interesting question. The, the question that I ask, and uh, uh, there is no answer in, this, in the academic literature, and I don't know any scientists, and I know most of them that do this kind of research, and as do you, uh, I don't know anybody that knows the answer in any absolute way. The question we have about remote viewing of precognition is when you ask a person to describe the future, are they describing, are they skipping over all the probabilities and going to the actual future, not that it's fixed, but as it will actually manifest, or are they describing the future, the highest probability of the future at the moment you're asking them the question? And one of the reasons that I did the 2050 experiment, and I'm now doing the 2060 experiment, is to answer her question. When you remote view something like a, a photo image, you know, Jeffrey, I'm going to show you a picture tomorrow. Can you describe it for me? Well, that has a virtually 100% probability that your description will, in fact, be a fixed future. That is, unless something happens to me or... Um, that where I can't show you the picture, uh, almost certainly I will be showing you the picture, and so that's 100%. But if we go 40 years into the future, are you describing all of the, the culmination of all of the probabilities, the choices that people can make with free will, or are you describing the highest probability that I, when I'm asking you the question? And I don't know the diff, I don't know the answer to that. One of the things I'm doing with the 2050 and 2060 data is seeing whether the answers to the 20, the same question in the 2050 data gets the same answer when it is asked of the 2060 data. And by the time I get through doing the analysis, I will be able to answer that question. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from Linda de Gonzalez. Uh, and this is a question that uh, I have uh, heard other people asking as well. It's based on our interview we did recently on the 2060 project. And uh, she asked, do you have any further information about the 2040-2045 event? Well, I've been doing a lot of research on that, and I am coming to suspect that it's not a event, that it is a, it's a confluence of trends. Now, the, 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 what I can see so far. First is a number of the European countries and a number of Asian countries and, and certain states in the United States are committing, interestingly enough, that they will have all internal combustion engine uh, vehicles off the roads by 2040. That's very interesting. Uh, the end of the internal combustion engine would be a huge transition. That's one part. The second part is that if you look at the climate change research that's coming out of the IPCC and the, the UN and, and research institutions all over the world, what you see is that 
they are all beginning to talk about the fact that by 2040 to 2045, massive change in the climate is going to cause an extraordinary change in the nature of civilization. So I think that's the second thing. And again, that's the same dates as the end of the internal combustion engine, 2040 to 2045. I never thought about this until the remote viewers talked about it. The third thing that I think is going on is that, again, by 2040, 2045, the great schism trend that we were just talking about um, appears that it's going to reach a kind of crescendo because increasingly, as the states make radically different choices about, oh, for instance, should, um, should government money be used to finance religious schools? I mean, the whole rise of white supremacy, Christian nationalism, which is really a kind of Christo-fascism, that is beginning to become a very big issue in a number of the red states and being violently opposed, not violently, but being strongly opposed by the blue states. And so I think what we're going to see is that by 2040, 2045, this is going to reach some kind of a crescendo where, uh, again, I think we're going to be looking at a country in which the blue states and the red states really have gone different directions and although they still have some kind of relationship, it's not the same kind of relationship we have today. Okay, here's a related question from Sabrina Camp, who asks, could the 2040 to 45 event be a major solar storm? And I also know that uh, one prominent remote viewer, at least I hear from viewers, that uh, one prominent remote viewer has predicted exactly that. Uh, could it be a great solar storm? Yes. Um, I have seen in the, in the 2060 literature that I'm looking at the data, uh, I do see a few references to that. I don't see a lot of references, so I'm not sure. I think what's going to happen, by the way, when I get through doing the analysis of the 2060 data, A, I'm going to write a book. Uh, and so anybody who's interested, I think you have up on your site, if you enter your, your email and your name, I'll notify you when the book comes out because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to publish it. But I'll let you know that it's going to come out. But I think I'm going to do, because of where I am in the analysis already, I'm going to do a, a third round of questions that evolve out of the 2050-2060 analysis. And I will specifically ask questions about that. I, 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 so in answer to her question, I see some references to this. I know there are several well-known remote viewers who have been talking about this. I do not see this as a major issue, as, as, as a, no, that's not quite right, as a major consensual observation. That's what I want to say. Very good. And I have yet, uh, well, it's not exactly a follow-up question. Mr. Black asks, is there any evidence that we made, isn't that interesting? He's putting in past tense referring to the future. Is there any evidence that we made contact with some ETs in the years uh, from 2050 to 2060? Also an interesting question. Um, again, I am looking at the data. I can't get a clear picture. So that's why, as I say, I, let's What's happening is I analyze this data. I mean, I got 10,000 pages of data. That's a lot of, it's a lot of data, a lot of work. Um, but what I'm beginning to look at is I need to do a third probe because there are questions like that one. Uh, do, do we have ET contact? What I will tell you about ETs, this is my 
I, I, I particularly note this is my own conclusion. I can't factually prove it, but based on what I see in the data, this is what I think is going on. I think that what is happening and the reason that we are seeing so many ET contacts now, you know, if you look at this data that's coming out of the government, particularly these pilots, I mean, they're talking about seeing uh, unified, unidentified aerial phenomena on a routine basis. I mean, you know, not, not, if not daily, weekly. I think what's going on is that we are being observed in the same way the cultural anthropologists on Earth would study a primitive tribe. That is, you want to observe them, but you don't want to intrude because that would distort what they're doing. And you don't want to do that. You want to see what they're doing. Because I, I have become convinced that no matter what planet and what species or whatever, there is a, the development of technology gets to a point where you have the ability to either destroy yourself or to awaken to a deeper level of understanding about the nature of your reality. In the case of humans and Earth, we are beginning to understand what Planck told us in 1931, and that is consciousness is causal and fundamental. And once you begin to see consciousness as causal and fundamental, you choose very different technological choices. For instance, we know that plastics are causing huge problems in pollution. And we need to change the way in which we make what we call plastics so that they are not pollutants. That's a different choice in technology. And I think what's happening is that the extraterrestrials are observing us because we're at that precipice that every culture, no matter where it is in the universe, gets to. We're at the point where our technologies are literally destroying our environment. And are we going to change? Or are we going to continue? In which case there is a very real chance that the Earth's ecosystem will completely rebalance itself and humanity will either be eliminated, el eliminated or it will be reduced to something quite different. And the choice is ours, that's the free will part. And it isn't clear to us yet. You can look at what's going on at the resistance to, to the, the Republican resistance to climate change. I mean, how anybody could vote against a bill that causes, that, that supports climate remediation, I can't imagine, because it's perfectly clear both from the heat waves, the fires, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the sea level rise, that the Earth's ecosystem is changing radically and that if we don't accommodate to that and remediate that, that life is going to get very difficult. Now the good news is when I talk to both the 2050s and the 2060s, they just seem to describe us on the other side of having made that choice and that we are now choosing a more life-affirming, compassionate approach than the ones that currently are going on. And the other thing that I'm also beginning to see, I was looking at it this morning, is what I would call the end of vampire capitalism. I mean, in the United States, we don't have capitalism. We have vampire capitalism because in our society, the only social value that, that dominates is profit. I mean, you look at what's the, 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 the petroleum industries are spending hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to try to block climate change remediation because, of course, it impacts their profits. So that's vampire capitalism. Are we going to change to a place where capitalism exists, but that well-being becomes the first social priority? Norway is an example of a capitalist country that has made well-being its, its first priority. 
And I think that's what the ET business is all about. They are watching us and seeing what choice we're going to make. Because every technological culture gets to this point and they want to see whether we're going to make it or not. I have a question from Vicki S. who writes about Lynn Buchanan, who was tasked to uh, look at the U.S. future in 2040. He expressed concern, she says, about a mega tsunami from La Palma that would hit the U.S. East Coast. And she wonders if your research shows anything about such an event. Um, I don't have anything about a massive tsunami. I don't see anything yet. What I do see very clearly is sea rise, massive sea rise. I mean, when I interview people and they, for instance, talk about Los Angeles, they tell me, well, you know, uh, Santa Monica is largely underwater, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, uh, all down the coast. When I talk to people on the East Coast, they, for instance, uh, they, they talk about Virginia Beach being largely underwater. They talk about the Outer Banks of North Carolina disappearing, which they are. And again, when I, I, when I get this kind of remote viewing data and I then start looking around to see is this being, is this likely, is this being proven to be true, is this emerging proof? or is there, is there something that contradicts it? What I get clearly is sea rise, but I, I don't have any specific data about huge tsunamis. I'm not saying it's not true, I'm just saying I don't have it. Okay, I do have a couple of related questions, however, to sea rise. Margaret Whitledge asks, uh, which cities or regions did people describe that were flooded? And have you figured out how much the sea level will rise by 2050? Um, well, uh, in general, all the coastal regions, uh, particularly along the East Coast, the East Coast seems to be uh, particularly impacted most of Florida seems to disappear. And in fact, again, if you look at the scientific data uh, that's, that's being published now, what you see is that's probably true. The Key West, everything from about um, Miami down uh, seems to be under threat. About, based on what I see, about 30% of Virginia Beach, Norfolk, is going to go underwater. The Outer Banks of North Carolina are going to disappear. Baltimore is going to be severely impacted. Boston severely impacted. New York, the whole lower end of Manhattan impacted. Uh, it's not a single sea rise. It seems to go from anywhere from two or three feet to in some areas as much as 20 feet. Again, that but remote viewing is not good at asking people how many feet because that's an analytical question and remote viewing doesn't is about not about analysis it's about reporting sense impressions so I have to approximate or I have to try to uh, one of the things for instance I can do is to say this is rather odd but I can say put your left foot on, uh, uh, on one edge of the shore and now move your feet over until your right foot gets to how deep it is and they just physically do it. I'll give you, and I'll give you an example of how that works. And then I get down on the floor and measure it with a tape measure. That's how I get to these numbers. To give you an example of how this plays out, I was asked by an architect some years ago who wanted me to remote view a hospital that he was designing and to see if there was anything about the hospital that he hadn't thought of that he ought to know. And uh, so I said, okay, I mean, I've never tried it before. I thought, what the hell, we'll give it a run. 
So I got a bunch of remote viewers and they did a, describe the hospital. But th this is the key point. When I asked them to describe the, the uh, move from the surgical suite to the recovery suite, and I did that because my father was an anesthesiologist and I knew that that was an issue. Um, I got them to literally, I'd say, put your left foot on the, the door jam on the left. Now move yourself over until your right foot hits the door jam on the right. And the difference, um, uh, and the dis th then I got down, literally I made chalk marks on the floor and then I measured it with a tape. And the answer I came up with was a foot and a half wider than he had currently planned. And I, I just told him that. I said, I don't know why this is true, but they tell me that this is the distance it ought to be here. And, um, and so he did. He changed the measurement. And lo and behold, by the time they got the hospital completed, some piece of apparatus that the anesthesiologists used that hung on the side of the gurney when they were moving you from the surgical suite to the recovery suite hung on the side of the gurney and um, they would not have been able to get it through the door if they hadn't added the foot and a half that the remote viewers had described because everything just fit and he wrote me and told me this that's how I know it and thanked me and said, you saved us a huge amount of trouble. We would have had to tear all the doors out and put them in, or we would have had to get them to redesign this technology. So thank you very much. And so I, it's hard to answer how deep the water gets because, again, you don't, can't get analytical answers, but I can just, from the descriptions they give me, uh, uh, measure how deep that must be. And here's a related question from Diana D. She says, regarding 2050, you said there would be a mass migration of people from the U.S. coasts affecting neighboring states. Did your research show what the most ideal states to move to would be? Yes, that actually, that is a question that I not only asked, but de that determined where I myself moved to. So you are asking a very good question. The answer is we're going to have three migration. Now, this is first the remote viewers. The remote viewers talk about these migrations. The academic research, the climatology research, is telling us that we're going to have three migrations. One is away from coastal regions, not only sea regions, but also river deltas. For instance, Louisiana, very heavily impacted. It's going to have a huge effect on New Orleans. So uh, coastal regions of all kinds, river deltas, that's one, because of too much water. Second, out of the southwest, because not enough water and also because of increased temperature. For instance, cities like Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, um, maybe Albuquerque, lots of towns in between, um, are going to become, I mean, the, the academic work, this is not the remote viewers, the academic work is now telling us they're going to become largely unlivable because First of all, the Colorado River is uh, the, we're having a huge water problem. Lake Mead and Lake Powell, I mean, Lake Mead has gone down 160 feet. It's only 27% of what it was a few years ago. So huge water problems uh, along the states that are involved, for instance, with the Colorado River. Also states which are using, which are uh, sucking up the subterranean water uh, because uh, as they suck the water out the land begins to sink temperatures which will be in uh, 100 to 119 120 
I mean, I've seen studies that about Phoenix, for instance, they could have as many as 150 days a year with temperature over 100. And I can tell you that that's very hard to live in a climate with that kind of temperature. And the third migration is out of the central states because of, in places, lack of water because they've sucked the water up from the subterranean water and also because of cataclysmic weather events. The two areas that seem to look most promising in the, in the uh, 2040, 2060 period is the Pacific Northwest on the west side of the mountains, which is going to get warmer and wetter, but uh, will be okay. Although there is an earthquake issue in Washington state. I mean, I moved to where I live in Washington because of of the climate and uh, remote viewing stuff. And the other area is the uh, northeast, sort of above Boston, Maine, Vermont, uh, which are also going to get warmer and wetter, but not along the coast, coastal regions, which will be impacted. So Pacific Northwest uh, and uh, northeast look like the most desirable areas. Um, Interestingly enough, the, the huge migrations that are going on in a number of the southwestern areas, uh, I think, are going to be dramatically altered as the water and temperature issue becomes more predominant. Okay, and I have an interesting question from Crystal A. She says, hello, Mr. Schwartz. Do you think artificial intelligence will be controlling our lives in the future? No. <laughs> okay, we can move on then. Uh, well, let me say a little more about that. <laughs> All right. what, what, I, what I see in the remote viewing data, and when I try to compare that with what's going on, what I'm also seeing in the... Uh, uh, academic and professional literature, industrial literature, is that AI is going to become more and more an issue, uh, more and more a factor, let me put it that way, more and more a factor in, in daily life uh, in all kinds of different ways. For instance, the 2060s and the 2050s describe a world when I ask them, how do you pay for things? They, cash is not even an issue, or credit cards. People seem to pay with uh, either a fingertip, some kind of an embedded chip, or with the, uh, a picture of their eyes, the iris of their eye. So, uh, which is linked in to artificial intelligence. It is clear that medicine changes quite significantly and that artificial intelligence plays a significant role in that. People are able to be monitored and get a medical treatment uh, in a quite different way than they get now. Uh, you'll be monitored and, and uh, artificial intelligence will tell your doctor when something that you're being monitored by uh, changes significantly and requires some further attention. Um, clearly, the descriptions of automobiles um, describe vehicles in which artificial intelligence plays a significant role, but the kind of dystopian matrix idea, no, I don't see that. Okay. In other words, artificial intelligence will have an important role to play, but it won't be controlling us. Yes, the, the kind of dystopian um, matrix or um, uh, uh, the, I've forgotten, Harrison, um, the movies we're seeing that, that show this dystopian future in which artificial intelligence controls everything. And no, I don't see that. I don't have people describe that. What I do see is artificial intelligence 
playing a very significant role in in how people conduct their lives. Here's a question from Kyle Thomas, who asks if there's been any clarification on the small energy sources you've mentioned previously that will be used in cars and in homes. Yes, I'm, I'm, I am looking at this, particularly with the 2050s, they described for me this, uh, this power source that was, uh, they described it as a box that you went out and bought and depending on what you, how much power you needed, that was the size of the box. And the only way that I could describe it that made any sense to me was they said it got warm, not hot, but warm. Is this fusion? I can't tell. And I can't find out in the, in the professional literature, the, you know, industrial academic literatures, I don't see something emerging that looks quite that straightforward. But clearly there is some energy source by 2040, 2050, 2060, which is providing energy in addition to a much greater use of solar, wind, and also tidal. Very good. Uh, here is a question from James Sheffer, who says, Given the exponential rather than linear progress of climate change, do you really view the existence of individual countries on this earth as far out as 2060? Yes, they describe a world where there are still individual cultures, but they also describe a world in which the various nations have had to coordinate in um, because you can't a single country cannot solve the climate problem you know um, it's going to require uh, cooperation between all the nations uh, you can see this in the current russian um, invasion of ukraine which is you can see how it plays out where because of what russia has done that hunger is going to be occurring, terrible hunger in countries like Africa because the grains that come out of uh, the Ukraine are not coming out in the same way. And so it, you, as you play that out, you can see that as sea rise occurs, it's going to radically change the transportation, the, the whole infrastructure of how things move around one of the things that I've begun to notice is that the 2060s talk more about growing crops locally so that there's less transportation, less shipping of things. And, and the only way that, that all of that is going to work is if there is greater coordination. And that may, that may also be a factor in what happens to the United States. The one thing that I do get I can already see is that the United States no longer dominates the world in the way that it does now. Okay. Here's a, an interesting question from Laura Newbert, who was one of our volunteers. And she, she brings up a fact, which I wasn't familiar with. Uh, and that is that the human body temperature has lowered by one degree in the last 30 years. And she wonders, it, could this be related to climate change? Oh, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, what I do get uh, is the other side of that, and that is that clearly areas, not just in the United States, but around the world, there are large areas that simply become unlivable because they're too hot for humans to live in. In any, I mean, you know, not, I mean, an individual, uh, you know, there are people that live in all kinds of circumstances, but in terms of large towns or cities or things like that. And in fact, in general, the description that most people give me of the future is that is much more about smaller communities. 
and so I and and a much more kind of minimalist is maybe not the right word, but it seems sort of Scandinavian or or um, Dutch. The simpler the architecture seems simpler. The description seems simpler. But as to the lowering of body temperature and its effect affected by climate change no I, I will tell you one of the other things I do get and you can see it in the literature it I mean you can it's already occurring is decreased uh, fertility of men the, the fertility of average American men has dropped significantly there are also a growing number of, of couples and even single women who are choosing not to have children because they're frightened about the future. Um, we clearly are going to see a, a, a very different kind of, of familial structure in the future. Um, the thing that really struck me as I went through, as I've, as I've been going through this data, is that the when I was part of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Secretary of Defense discussion group on innovation technology in the future or the Smithsonian study group on in innovation technology in the future with all these futurists uh, including myself but not me they were obsessed with overpopulation I'm sure you remember that there was just a huge Oh, we're going to have so many people. It's just going to be too many people, and we're going to run out of raw materials. And I don't get any of that in the remote viewing data. Uh, actually, one of our uh, viewers asked, "Do you have an estimate of how large the population uh, globally would be by 2060?" Well, again, the problem is that's an analytical question. You know, give me a number. I can't do that. What I can tell you is when I say, is overpopulation a problem, they either say, no, it's not a problem, or in some cases and in some countries, they say, no, quite the contrary, underpopulation is a problem. Now, I have not explored exactly why that occurs, but what I am pretty confident about is that the original concern in the 70s and 80s of this huge hassle about overpopulation just is not an issue. Uh, but possibly underpopulation. In uh, some areas, yes. Uh, Andrei Slavash Krasowski, a regular viewer and a regular question asker on our live stream events asks, what do you think about remote viewing the future, trying something like, and he puts it in quotation marks, hacking reality? For example, getting proofs of theorems, scientific theories, or trying to recognize how psi is understood scientifically. I'm not sure. Well, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question, but let me see if I can address some parts of it. One of the interesting things that has occurred in the 60 years that I have been doing research is that um, we have learned that there are certain things that you can do that can manipulate the accuracy or the ability to attain accurate information. That's that's the important part. There are two things particularly. One is numinosity. Numinosity is a, is a process of coherence. When you have a great number of people who, who, for instance, observe something, particularly in an emotional state, like a religious shrine or something, I think before when we talked about this, I, I said Chartres Cathedral compared to a French warehouse of the same size physically, what we know is that the more numinous a target is, whether it's a, a, a single picture or whether it's a situation, the more numinous it is, the easier it is for remote viewers to describe it. 
it's like it's a neon light. You know, remote viewing is in many ways like doing a Google search. I ask a question of the remote viewer, and basically they go, they open to the non-local consciousness aspect of their consciousness, and they acquire information. So the the key to the whole business is your it's it's all about information. And in fact, one of the things that we are also learning is a growing conviction amongst a, 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 a growing number of scientists that what we are looking at and what we call reality is in fact an information phenomena. That is, remote viewers are acquiring information or put in another area, uh, reincarnation researchers are looking at information coming across in the form of birthmarks or wound uh, scars from previous lives or people coming in with certain attributes. So what comes across between lives <clears throat> is not that you're coming back, you're not, but that when this eternal self, uh, which is the non-local aspect, manifests another personality, that it does so using information from previous incarnations. So numinosity is an informational enriching process. And the other thing that we know has an effect on people's ability to describe things is entropic process. And I, by entropic process, I don't just mean physical entropy. Entropic process, whereas numinosity is a movement toward coherence, entropic process is a movement to discoherence. And it's not just physical discoherence, it's also informational discoherence. And I personally think that's why people see ghosts. What they're looking at is an informational architecture that lingers in a situation because death is an entropic process itself. When you move from corporeal life to discorporeal life, that's an entropic process. So anything that involves entropic process or anything that involves increased numinosity makes things easier to see. Well, incidentally, we're at the top of the hour now. We're going to continue the live stream for another half hour till we reach the bottom of the hour. Well, back to the question by Andrei Slavash Krasowski. I think when he's talking about hacking reality, he, he may have had something in, line, uh, in mind like a project you and I were once uh, involved in that didn't go anywhere at the time, which was to find a cure for, uh, at the time we were looking at multiple sclerosis. But right. can, can you use it, in other words, to go into the future where an answer exists to a present day problem and, and uh, come up with that answer? Yes, that you can do. For instance, uh, yes, you remember the George Ellis and the Multiple Sclerosis Project. The idea there was if he, George had, this was a, a, a medical uh, researcher in Los Angeles, he had five vectors of research, five approaches to treating MS and each of them were very time consuming and very expensive. And, and as you remember, he approached me because the question was, could we tell him which of the five approaches he was going to take would be the, the one that would succeed? Because if we could order them and say number three is the way to go, and he did number three first, and it was in fact successful, then he would save millions of dollars. He wouldn't have to do one, two, or four or five. And I have tried that in other situations where you have multiple choices that you could make to see if we could pick the choice that would give the best outcome. And yes, you can do that. And uh, to change um, the topic a bit, William Ritako asks if you have had any experiences or 
Anyone you know has had the experience of remote viewing the afterlife and a related question that was posed, I don't recall who posed it just now, was in the future, will the existence of the afterlife become more widely accepted in, in the mainstream institutions? Okay, the first question. Um, basically, mediumship is remote viewing using discarnates as sources of information. And there are several very interesting examples. You know, I, as you know, I'm a data person. I want objective verification before I'm willing to sign on. And there are several examples. I'll just give you one. Frederick Bly Bond, uh, a name probably not known to most people, but Frederick Bly Bond was a, an archeologist, an amateur archeologist really, who reconstructed Glastonbury Cathedral, one of the leading Christian shrines in, in Great Britain. And he located all kinds of things. Uh, and he did it using automatic writing, which is just another form of remote viewing. As I said, there are a lot of ways to do this. He and another military officer, uh, a military officer with whom he was friends, would sit down at a table and they would both put their hands on the same pen and they would ask a question and kind of meditate and the pen would move around and and sometimes it would write things and and that that's how they were guided i talked to people for instance who were then very old men back when i was writing this in my book secret vaults of time uh, who had worked with bly bond as young men and they they were very they never did quite understand it they would say to me he would come out in the morning and he would say okay let's march off into this field and they'd march off into the field he'd be counting his steps and then he'd say stop okay dig down right here and this is what you're going to find and in fact they would dig down and they would find it and in that way he was able to reconstruct Glastonbury Cathedral, find the Edgar Chapel, which was a subject of great debate at the time, locate several burials, all kinds of things. And he did all of that by contacting the, uh, the monks who had built the cathedral and, the, and peopled the abbey. They were called the Watchers. And they would guide him through, their automat through his automatic writing they would tell him what to do and where to go. And so you can use non-local consciousness, which is mediumship is just another form, another manifestation of non-local consciousness. You can use it to contact discarnates, discorporeal personalities, and, um, and get information. When I was doing the Alexandria project and was trying to find Cleopatra's palace, which we found, um, several of the remote viewers that I worked with uh, were also mediums and claimed that Cleopatra was guiding them to tell them where it was and they marked it on a map and that's where it was. So can you get information from discorporeal people that you can use in, and, and objectively verify there are other cases of this, but yes, the answer is yes, you can do that. And the second question, what was the second one? Uh, well, greater mainstream acceptance regarding yes. the afterlife. Yes. Um, I think from what I can understand of the 2060s, the idea that consciousness is causal and fundamental has become a fundamental part of science by by 2060 and is guiding the choices that that are being made and again it has to do with choosing different technologies and and considering the impact that they have on the matrix of life and here is another question from our mutual friend and thinking aloud guest john alexander <laughs> who asks 
Does increased acceptance of the continuation of consciousness beyond bodily death have an impact on human interactions from both a personal and international level? That is a, that is a question that I am trying to answer. I'm not quite ready to answer that yet. What I get is that the whole view of the world is, has changed, that people look, they, they conceive of who they are and, and their place in, in, in their society is conceived differently. And of course, um, what I'm trying to figure out, and I don't have the answer yet, and if I don't get it out of what I've got, I'll do additional research. But you know, the, in the Eastern cultures, the idea of karma, the idea that information comes across and that it influences events which occur in your life and the choices you make in this life will influence situations in future manifestations of your eternal self, future personalities. That changes the whole way you look at the world and you, the choices you make because you realize that in a certain level you will be held accountable. And so I get the sense that people, first of all, they're, they're more communal than they are today. They're more aware of communal interactions Whether that changes the way governments deal with one another and other things, I don't know the answer to that yet. I've got another question here from William Ritacco, who points out that Ray Kurzweil has made a famous prediction of, of what they are calling the singularity in 2045, which, I, as I understand it, that's the point at which they think computers will achieve consciousness. Uh, do you see anything uh, in your research that relates to Kurzweil's predictions? The idea that artificial intelligence becomes conscious? I, I don't see, no, I don't see that. Um, there are, there are, issues about that that I have. I, I mean, I, Kurzweil has done a lot of very good things. I'm actually on one of his boards. But I, that is a kind of materialist view. I don't think we create consciousness. I think that consciousness, we are the creations of consciousness, that all consciousness was created by some greater unity, and I don't know how, I, I can't tell you how that happened, but the idea that machines are going to be turned into conscious beings, no, I don't see any of that. What I do see is that they're going to make many of the decisions that are now made, which we think of as conscious choices, because they evaluate the probabilities of a particular outcome, but that's not the same thing as consciousness. And here's a very interesting question from Christos Vlamis, who asks, what is the role of religion by 2060? Has it subsided or has it been strengthened? Um, well, if you look at what's going on in the United States now, you see that, that um, millions of people are falling away from religion. Partly that's because of the, the transformation of Christianity in the United States to Christofascism, a term I coined and I'm now seeing other people use, but I think it's a good term. I would say to you, and this is really a whole conversation we would need to do, it would take longer than we've got here today, my own personal view is that religion as a proposition, it doesn't matter which religion, is in fact 
a kind of empirical observational science that people have learned to use because of observation over millennia, but it's really about non-local consciousness. You know, if you look at if you look at religions, the the big enduring religions, not the cults, and, but but the big enduring religions with millions of people. What you see is all of them begin because one individual has a non-local consciousness experience or experiences. <clears throat> Jesus is baptized by John. He goes into the desert and he meditates and he awakens. Uh, Mohammed goes up to the Hira cave, a sacred cave, and he has a non-local consciousness experience and he awakens. Uh, Buddha goes to an ashram to study with a teacher and he's taught meditation and he awakens. So when you look at the major religions of the world, I mean, religions like Hinduism are so old that there's not a single individual associated with founding them. But when you look at the major religions where there is a founder, what you see is it all begins because that individual has a non-local consciousness experience and learns to meditate because all the stories are about how these people wake up and they start meditating and then they become who they become historically. So religion is really about learning how to open to non-local consciousness. That's what all the dogmas are about, all the beliefs. If you really look at them, if you strip away the, the, the dogmas, what you get very clearly is that this, there are several concurring elements. There's the place that you go to meditate or to gather for the, for the service, whether it's a Buddhist or Hindu or Christian or Jewish, doesn't make any difference. Why do they go to the same place? Because, as I said earlier about numinosity, because individual acts of intention to observation make something more numinous and in religion we call that sacred. What religion calls the soul, in science we would call the eternal self. The prophecy, speaking in tongues, uh, dramatic healing, those are all examples of expressions of non-local consciousness. Non-local perception, non-local perturbation. They're basically two kinds of phenomena. And they may only be one, but anyway, Functionally, there's two kinds, non-local perception, non-local perturbation. That's a whole subject we could get into. But in any case, we know, for instance, that where individuals gather in a place they consider sacred, if they chant, drum, sing, dance together, that brain entraining occurs. That is, all of their brains entrain. They're all making the same the wavelengths are all the same. And when that happens, then some individuals, sometimes, not all individuals, not all times, have non-local consciousness experiences. If, you know, they speak in tongues, they, they do healings, they make prophecies. I mean, that's been true no matter what religion you look at. So the whole of religion, from my perspective, is really about understanding that you are a manifestation of consciousness. You are not just animated meat. I'd like to ask a follow-up question um, from myself, if I may. Uh, would you equate non-local consciousness or consciousness with God? I mean, you've been talking about religion. Do you, do you see that there's any way to talk about God uh, from a realistic, scientific, or philosophical perspective. Yes, I think what we call God is in fact this unity of consciousness. I do not think there is a hoary old man with a big white beard sitting on a throne somewhere deciding what's going to happen. Uh, what I think is going, what we call, as I say, religions are empirical sciences. You know, it's, if, again, if you look at why is meditation such a big deal, 
Why are uh, sacred spaces so important? What you see is the manifestation that results from centuries of observational empirical science. Okay, that's an excellent answer. Uh, Cynthia Sue Larson, who has also been a guest on New Thinking Aloud and is a good friend from my uh, days in California and, and even in Las Vegas. Anyway, she asks, what did you find was most surprising between the results of remote viewing 2050 and 2060? I don't know the answer to that yet. That's exactly what I was saying earlier when I talked about when you are asked to describe the future as a remote viewer, are you describing, are you jumping through all of the probabilities and arriving at the fixed future? Or are you describing the highest probability at the time the question is asked? I hope that distinction is clear. And I don't know the answer to that yet, but that's one of the reasons that I'm doing the 2050 and the 2060 project. Okay, and just a reminder to our viewers that we have about 12 minutes left. The live stream will end at the bottom of the hour. Here's a question from JLR who asks, in your observations because of medical advancements, Will there be an extended lifespan for humanity by 2050 or 2060? Um, I don't have an absolute answer for that because I didn't ask that question. But what I do think is probably true is that um, if we make if we make choices that move from the materialism of today to recognizing that fostering well-being is the most important activity, that we will see increased lifespan. Right now, most Americans don't seem to get this, the lifespan of Americans is dropping like a rock. We, um, we don't live anywhere near as long as, for instance, people live in countries in Europe or in, even in Asia. American life expectancy has dropped several years because of our diet, our lack of exercise, the fact that we, so much of our technologies produce pollutants, microtoxins that, that invade our lives and our bodies. And so the question really becomes, what would it take to cause an increased lifespan? And I think the big answer to that and, and, and why I think it may be possible or may be true is that if we choose different technologies, choose to develop different technologies, outlaw technologies that produce pollution and toxicity, and we change the way we eat. I mean, most fast foods, in fact, most processed foods are so filled with things that influence our lives in negative ways that the first thing I would say to anybody is only eat organic food. Stop eating large quantities of meat. And all the medical research tells you the same thing. So if we can get control of the toxins that pollute so much of our lives, the water we drink, uh, the food we eat, the air we breathe, we need to get the toxin threshold greatly reduced. If we can do that, then life expectancy will increase. If we don't, then life expectancy will continue to decline. And I was really struck by how much it has declined. A related question here from Nate Grossman is, uh, has remote viewing given you any insight into possible future epidemics? Oh, yes, we're going to have more epidemics. You know, when I began the 2050 data, I, I had no idea about epidemics. And I, I just said to people, tell me about health care. And they would start talking to me and I would say, well, then, you know, are things healthier? And 
And they would say, well, no, there are all these pandemics. And I thought, pandemics? I you know, immediately thought about Spanish flu in 1918. And I said to the remote viewers, this is the 1978, 1979, 1980, when I was doing that, starting this, and they would say to me, no, no, there are going to be a bunch of pandemics. The first one is a blood disease which crosses over from primates to humans, and it's going to kill millions of people. And I went to a friend of mine, someone you know, uh, who was deputy director of National Institutes of Health at the time, and said to him, do you know anything about a blood disease that's going to cross over from primates to humans? <clears throat> this is 7980. Cross over from primates to humans and it could kill millions of people? And as I think I've said to you once before, he said to me, Stefan, I don't know what you're smoking, but quit. That's nonsense. We don't know anything about that. And then, of course, in 1981, AIDS emerges and kills 35 million people. Then comes SARS, H5N1, and now we're living through COVID, which has also killed millions of people. The thing we need to be clear about is as climate change continues, the viruses and bacteria which cause these problems are going to mutate in order to meet the changed conditions of their environment, and we aren't going to have any resistance to it. And so I anticipate we're going to have a whole string of pandemics of which COVID is just the most recent one. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the live stream, but here's a very interesting question from a viewer who calls himself the Bearded Jedi. And, <laughs> and he or she, I guess it must be male, asks, can remote viewing cause side effects? You mean sort of if you do remote viewing, do you have side effects? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, yes. Oh, I, I, it took me a minute to really take that question aboard. Yeah. Yes. In order to be a good remote viewer, you should start being a daily meditator. If you become a daily meditator, and I have, I have produced, I did a, a huge amount of scientific research on meditation. I'm not interested in the religious expression of meditation. Uh, th th that is the dogma belief part. I'm interested in the scientific neurophysiological aspects. And I produced a, a, a CD you can download. You can go to my website, stephanaschwartz.com and download it. It's called Meditation for Modern Minds and is specifically designed for modern minds because most meditation techniques developed centuries ago in environments and cultures that had very little of the stimulation that we get, didn't have all the electronic stuff and all everything. And so they were developed, they developed in cultures that were very different. And I wanted to develop a meditation technique that was specifically designed for modern, modern uh, technological culture. And meditation for modern minds is that. It, it, I can't get into the whole thing, we don't have enough time, but it teaches you how to develop an approach and then to use techniques which allow you to change fundamentally the way you approach things in life, get rid of bad habits, overcome um, weaknesses that you have. Uh, I would say to you that the most important gift you can give yourself is to develop the daily practice of meditation. How you do it is less important than that you do it. But the meditation for modern mind uh, uh, download that you can get is specifically designed to help modern people. Well, now, how is this related to a potential side effect of remote? Well, mind? the side effect is uh, you stop doing bad things that you're doing. I mean, not all side effects are negative. The, what I misunderstood in the question when you first asked it was the presumption, are there negative side effects to doing remote viewing? And the answer to that is no, uh, but there are some very positive side effects to doing remote viewing. 
particularly if you will develop the practice of meditation, which will make you a better remote viewer. You know, th this business of teaching these techniques as if they are the best and only technique is simply not, it's not true. It's not based in, in factual data. There are lots of different ways to access non-local consciousness. What is more important than the technique is that you develop the ability to attain and sustain intention focused awareness. And the way you do that is to develop the daily practice of meditation. And if you develop the daily practice of meditation along the lines that I describe, you can completely reprogram your consciousness. Okay, well, we're getting very close to the end of our time now. We've had a very large uh, live viewing audience, over 3,000 people. And I imagine once the uh, archival video is live in the next 24 hours, it'll be well up over 10,000. Uh, but let's give our viewers uh, once more the information. If you're interested in getting on the mailing list to receive a notification when Stefan finally completes the book with all the details about the uh, year 2060 uh, worked out, uh, if you want notification of that book, you can pre-register on Stefan's website. And the uh, URL to do that happens to be in the description of this live stream video right now. So if you click on the description, which is below the video, you'll see where to, where to do it. Also, I would like to let everyone know that the uh, New Thinking Aloud publishes a weekly newsletter. It's free. And, and you can sign up for that at the website of the New Thinking Aloud Foundation, which is newthinkingaloud.org. And aloud, of course, is A-L-L-O-W-E-D, not A-L-O-U-D, and New Thinking Aloud is all one word. So, uh, Stefan, I would like to thank you very much for being with me today. I think this has been a very enlightening conversation, and uh, I hope that we do many more. And, and in fact, we're talking about doing many more. Absolutely. Always a pleasure, Jeff. And, and thank all of your viewer listeners for uh, their, uh, asking very smart questions, and I hope I've given uh, reasonable answers. I think the questions and the answers have both been excellent today, and I am going to end 